Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. I'd like to wish all of my viewer in the United States a happy Thanksgiving. And this week, as my usual alternating cycle, I have a video game review for you. And this time it's of, well, a new game for once. Actually, come to think about it, this is the first new or newish game I've reviewed ever on this show. I don't have any gameplay footage for you this time because, well, I still don't have a capture rig set up yet and I didn't have a chance to get any gameplay video downloaded over Thanksgiving weekend. But that's okay. We can still get this done. So this week we're breaking down GoldenEye 007 Reloaded for the Xbox 360. Because this is a game based on another game, based on a movie, or if we want to get more technical and specific, a game remaking a Wii reimagining of an N64 game adapting a movie I'm not going to do my usual plot by plot breakdown, or rather plot by beat, plot beat breakdown. It's kind of not worth it. Instead, I want to focus on the differences between the two, as far as the major changes in the game's plot, as opposed to just all the little nitpicks here and there. First off, well, this game has Daniel Craig as Bond instead of Pierce Brosnan. This seems like it might be a little thing, but it's really not. Frankly. Craig's Bond in the stories is just starting off. He is, as of now, only been a double O for a relatively short period of time. By comparison, Brosnan's Bond is a veteran, is an experienced double O. He has been doing this for some time, which is what m makes in the film the change of M a big deal. They made a big deal out of, well, Judy Dench being the first female M. At the time, not unsurprising, but it might seem a little bit different now since we've become grown accustomed to Judy Dench in the role. But because Daniel Craig just became a double O, a lot of the stuff in the original film that were major plot points, both in terms of the backstory and the characters, can't work. Um, just as a big example, Bond wouldn't have been active during the Cold War. He, for that matter, wouldn't have had enough time for the time skip from the pre-credits teaser to the next part of the game, which would allow for, basically, Alec Trevelyan to create a new ident identity, start up Yanis, and set in plan his, his, well, plan to destroy the British economy. So, thus consequently, you can't base your game about, base your game, ah. Consequently, you can't base your game around the fall of the Soviet Union, the almost overnight conversion of the Soviet bloc into a capitalist bunch of countries, a capitalist economy, and with all the changes that happened to that, that was a major focus of GoldenEye's plot. You just can't do that because Bond wasn't active then and making the changes to do that wouldn't work. So instead, this also means that Alec Trevelyan, 006, has to have been building Yanis, or Janus, or however you pronounce it, while he was a double O. You can't give him the time to fake his death or otherwise just die were believed to have died, and then take his resentment at being left for dead, combined with all the other problems and anger he had with the fates of his parents, and the way they were treated by the British government, and let that fester and have him turn that into the Janus, or Janus organization. You don't have enough time for that. He has to do it while he's being a double O. This also means that you have to change his motivation as well. In the original film, basically, 006 was upset at the British government. Not upset, he is enraged at the British government for the way they treated his parents during World War II. His parents were Cossacks. They were actually... They were Russians. A um, bit of an explanation for why the Cossack bit makes sense, since it's important. And this is something that isn't explained that well in the original movie as well. There was a civil war in Russia shortly after the Soviets took the power between two different 
groups which had different ideas of how the Russian government would work. The white Russians and the red fac and the reds. Red faction. The red faction was the one that won. It was backed by Lenin, by Stalin, Trotsky, and num and so numerous other major communists who would become a major part of the Russia that would be to come. Since the Cossacks were on the wrong side, they basically became, well, a group that was not wanted by the government. They were not quite political prisoners, but they were a minority that was put down upon and oppressed. Consequently, when the Nazis invaded Russia during the Second World War, the Cossacks were happy to help the Russians and to ha ha not Russians. Consequently, when the Nazis invaded Russia during World War II, the Cossacks were happy to help the Nazis. After all, the enemy my enemy is my friend, right? Kind of. The Cossacks were somewhat treated well by the Russians. The Russians. God, fuck. Thought over this bit. Quick bit of explanation about the whole Cossack thing. This is something that isn't explained too well in the original film. In World War I, just after World War I, when the so when the communists had taken over Russia, there was a bit of a not a bit, there was a civil war, not between the communists and the loyalists to the monarchy, but between basically two different factions who wanted to shape how this new communist government would work, the white and the red faction. As you can imagine, considering that the flag of the Soviet Union was red, and that communists tended to be referred to as being reds for the decades, if not, if not, no, not century, but the decades after the Soviets took over, the reds won. The problem with the Cossacks was that they backed the whites. And thus, well, they got the short end of the stick politically. They were basically in bad straits with the Soviet government. And so when the Nazis invaded during World War II, hey, as far as the Cossacks were concerned, this was their way to get payback. So they backed the Nazis. Um, however, when the Nazis lost, the Cossacks were actually basically captured by the British before they they were captured by the Russians, or before the Russians had a chance to get them. Now, the Cossacks probably thought this was a really good thing. Because after all, if the Russians had got them, they were collaborators. Collaborators during World War II, particularly collaborators with the Nazis, did not fare well. And the Cossacks, at least at first, or at least the lower ranking, thought that they would have gotten, basically, could plead for asylum, explain their case, and while they might not have gotten the best treatment they had as the British, they likely would have still faced a certain degree of criminal charges for the atrocities that they committed. And in particular, the Cossacks who got tasked with defending the Nazi front or the, the German lines in northern Italy definitely did commit some atrocities. They would face charges for that, but they wouldn't be in Russia. However, the British signed a treaty with, or rather, as part of the agreements for how Europe would be divided up once the war was over, the other allies, the Americans, the Brits, French agreed to reinter any Russians that were that they rescued from prisoner of war camps, without question. To a certain extent, I can see why they just would straight up agree to this. I'm not going to say that the perception of the of Soviet Russia in the West was completely rosy during the um, before World War II, but at the time they probably figured, okay, hey. The Russians are going to basically welcome all their prisoners back with open arms. We're not going to have a wave of people looking to defect or looking to seek asylum as political prisoners to uh, the United States or to Great Britain. Then, the, then they rescued the Cossacks, and the Cossacks 
or not so much rescued as much as captured the Cossacks, and the Cossacks pled for asylum, demanding to, or at least asking, to be taken in by the British, the Americans, somebody who wouldn't send them back to Russia. However, Russia insisted on having the Cossacks back, and the British, in particular, accept, acquiesced. And thus, well, when the Russians got back, I'm not going to say they had a good old ethnic cleansing, but the Cossacks fared poorly, and many of them, particularly those who were who would have been soldiers, were massacred by the Russian military. In the original Goldeneye film, this led to basically Alexander's rage. His parents were Cossacks and were witness to this massacre. And he hated the British for what they'd done and for allowing this horrible thing to happen. So, we come to the, to the new game. That doesn't work now for Trevelyan's motivation. You can't have Og Trevelyan be the child of Cossacks. The, the only way you can make this work as far as tying them to this massacre would be to have his, to have, well, his grandparents be Cossacks. And then have this this hatred and stuff passed on from his parents. But part of the problem with that is, the other part of Valen's backstory, he's an orphan. And he and Bon are linked by the shared connection, their their bond, well, no pun intended, of being orphans. I don't recall if in either the film or the novel by Raymond Benson that they I think it was Raymond Benson that they have Bond and Trevelyan been in school together at any point? Have any earlier connection beside, before joining MI6? But the problem is that then you have a Catch-22. You either have the Cossack connection or you keep the orphan bit. The orphan bit makes things more personal for Bond, but the Cossack bit makes... Well, Trevelyan's motivation for wanting this plan slightly more justified. A little less now that we have, um, well, several generations since World War II. But this leads to my complaint about the motivation that gets is a replacement. Trevelyan's motivation is no longer revenge. Trevelyan's motivation is, well... He's now a more well-funded Binder Mainoff gang. If you're not familiar with the Binder Mainoff gang, or Bader Mainoff gang, go on Netflix Instant Streaming. There's a film called, well, the, I believe it's called the Binder Mainoff, not the gang, but the complex or something like that. Yeah, Binder Mainoff complex. It's a German docudrama about this group, which were a bunch of pseudo-revolutionaries terrorists turned criminals in West Germany during the Cold War. And they originally had political intentions, but then they started getting into more bank robberies and less about the political social aspect of things and more about blow stuff up, take money, kill people. And thus the, the iron, irony of a basically this sort of group being like Fighter Minoff, except with absurdly massive amounts of funding, makes it kind of silly. And that's the problem. By the way, my major problem with this is Trevelyan wasn't silly in the movie. You kind of felt bad for the guy. Trevelyan's plan kind of made sense. You don't agree You don't agree with what he's doing. You don't agree with, I, mean, I totally agree with why. But he felt like a more well-intentioned extremist or just someone in the froze, froze of vengeance than someone who's just kind of <sighs> being a political straw man. Because that basically, in short, his motivation to describe it in total is he blames the bankers, not specified, just bankers, for the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and for the global global economic collapse, which 
I'm not going to go into political arguments on this. There's a certain, at least with the, with the economic collapse, there's a certain degree of yes about that. But basically, his plan is well. I'm going to get revenge and make them pay for this by stealing all their money and then frying London with the golden eye weapon. The problem is, all these banks are massive econ are massive international economic powerhouses. Or at least they were until things started collapsing and they need to be bailed out. Um, which means they have assets and records everywhere. And if they don't have records in... As, aside from records in London, the ones who you would be blaming, who you would be legitimately blaming for this, the big ones, would have records also in Zurich or New York or Japan at Tokyo or Paris or Beijing numerous other places which means frying just London isn't going to do enough damage to really kill them um either you steal the money fry London and then at which point they go look at their records and go oh okay this is where things were when all of a sudden London's computers disappeared we'll just reset things to that we can restore all our all our back transactions. This is why Nasdaq and all these other computerized stock exchanges have regular offsite backups. Is in case of a major computer catastrophe, they can take things back to before things were before. A certain degree of money will be lost in terms of transactions of existing transactions, but it doesn't. But a computer failure doesn't kill the global economy instantly. Not in one place. So this, this ruins some of the logical sense of that plot. In the original film, Trevelyan's theft was part of it, but wasn't the focus of the plot. His plan was, he fries London, fries the government's computers, the British government's computers, which if they're backed up anywhere else, it's going to be elsewhere in Britain, possibly even elsewhere in London. And then the money theft is just, oh, I'm going to be paying off my... This is due... Give me a benefit, a side benefit, and to also pay off, pay for all the people who have hired to do this plan. Because they're not interested in the same revenge as I am. In the game, it's just, it's a bank heist. It's a bank heist with political overtones, and it's a bank heist that's easily, th it's, in terms of, once you've done it, it's easily thwarted. Or at least, it's not as damaging as the character thinks it is, and as the writers probably think it is. To re if this was actually to do what Travalin expected it to do, or had to do the damage they would have wanted it to do, it would have taken a much more dramatic number of, gold of GoldenEye weapons to do it. He would have had to basically fry New York, London, Zurich, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and possibly also Moscow, Beijing, and maybe even also the Cayman Islands. That means you need at least at least five possible five to eight golden eye weapons to pull off your plan and even then if you do that you can't get the heist off because at which point your heist is based off computerized m money transfers and they'd be transferring to other banks that you're frying which means you'd have to have cash money or substantial physical assets to pay your pay off your people which means that your plans not they're not going to work or your specter or you're some other major Bond villain, like, with resources like, well, Hugo Drax, which means we're no longer in, well, not, we're not in a Daniel Craig movie, we're not in the Pierce Brosnan Bond movie, we're in Roger Moore. We're in Roger Moore where the villain's plan is, we're, as I'm going to fry the world with my death weapon satellite, and only my chosen followers will survive, which doesn't include the minions who aren't getting taken up on the shuttle. Not that they know this. It's a dumb plan. Straight up. Which is unfortunate. The only way this works is if you do it like Spectre's doing it. This is some plan for Spectre, by Spectre to hold the world for ransom. 
We will fry all your banks unless you give us one billion dollars. But by which point, you're a Connery Bond movie. And actually, to a certain extent, this also ruins with some of the, the plot threads of the other Bond films because, well, there's Quantum. We've seen them in two Bond films and thus far with Daniel Craig, and they're not wiped out yet, so they could be in plenty more. And they're out for money. They, like Spectre, are out for money, but where Spectre is willing to hold the world for ransom and plans which are silly, Quantum is willing to go, we want your money, we don't want to get caught, so we will engineer things so we can make lots of money from lots of people on from the background and have lots of power and influence without necessarily drawing massive world governments coming down on us. Like, for example, the spot, the plot in Quantum of Solus, where basically their goal was, we're going to take over this country's water supply. We're going to make it that this country cannot live, literally can't live without us. That was clever. This is not. As an added little side problem, yes, this film was topical. So was, this film was very topical. So is Goldeneye. The original film. The problem was Goldeneye's topic ability, if that's a word, had to do with the fact that, well, the Soviet Union just fell. The Soviet Union just fell. And, well, this is going to be in the history books forever. I mean, not forever, but when I have children, this will be taught in their history class. Their children will be taught in their history class about the fall of the Soviet Union. This is a freaking big, fat, hairy deal, geopolitical-wise, history-wise. Thus, as far as Bond films are concerned, when it comes to this movie, it's still kind of, it's, well, it's a, well, it's kind of dated. It's a, in a way, dated in a way that works. It's dated in a way that fits, that catches people's attention and keeps things interesting and doesn't make people laugh and roll their eyes and chuckle. Other Bond films have been dated in the other way. Best examples being The Living Daylights, with Bond helping out the Mujahideen fight off the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Um, or License to Kill, with Bond basically taking on the Medellin drug cartel. And those kind of films are kind of slightly laughable and chuckleable, because... The Medellin cartel ultimately turned out not to be as much of a threat as we thought it was. And yes, it took a lot of work to take him down. But it doesn't feel like the same kind of threat that Bond normally fights. And the... Well, the, the Soviet invasion of, of Afghanistan didn't necessarily need Bond's help. I mean, yes, there's other. The plot of the film is focused on other things, but the main center point, centerpiece of the film is Bond goes to Afghanistan. Actually, the same problem for both these films can be said about Rambo Part Three and the Tom Clancy film Clear and Present Danger. They both have the same problem of they are horrifically dated now in really silly ways, like the President of the United States ordering a secret co a, a covert basically super war against the drug cartels. By super war, I mean we're using stealth bombers to drop specially designed cellophane bombs on drug kingpin comp meetings. We have... Um, we're dropping Delta Force to take out drug processing labs and that sort of stuff. That's... That's not the kind of thing you do for a standard war on drugs. That's just getting silly. That's just getting really silly. That said, I don't see this game having the same leg as that, well, any Bond movie has. Because it's like, just by the nature of the medium. But still, you gotta think about these things whenever you're trying to be topical. And with that out of the way... Let's talk a little bit about gameplay. Now this game is built by Activision. It runs using the Call of Duty engine with everything that that entails. It plays exactly like a Call of Duty game. 
Straight up. Left trigger aims or zooms in your target. Right trigger fires. Bumpers handle grenades. Um, click the stick to melee. If you played a Call of Duty game, you played this. Or the, you'll know exactly how to play this. You pick up the controls, it works exactly the way everything else does. For better or worse. If you don't like the Call of Duty games, you won't like how this game plays. Or, the, or rather, if you don't like the Call of Duty games gameplay, you won't like how this game plays. If you like the Call of Duty games gameplay, you will love how this game plays. There are some problems with checkpointing um, in several places. Particularly, the worst occurrence of this is in the last level of the game, towards the end. You are protecting the Bond girl, Natalia, as she hacks several console, computer consoles to divert the GoldenEye satellite to make it um, burn up in the atmosphere. And this is a wave-based survival thing. You protect Natalia on the console while she finishes doing stuff on one console and move on to the next one to the next one. That's basically three... There, there's several waves per console, but, there's se but and theoretically there should be three checkpoints here. One at the beginning, one after each console is completed, and one at the end. And that's not how they do it. They have one call checkpoint at the beginning and one checkpoint at the end once you've finished everything. If you die at any point, if you if the console is destroyed or Natalia is injured, and if the thing they add of a giant wave of plasma, which I suspect is supposed to be focused sunlight from the solar facility that they're at, if that progresses along the, le the level and kills you or destroys the console before you finish and kill all the enemies, then this doesn't, then you have start over at the beginning. This is bad checkpointing. This is really bad checkpointing. Because there is nothing worse than getting through a 5 to 10 minute sequence nearing the very end and then have, for some stupid reason, you miss a guy, you take too long clearing everyone out, and something like that. Having to start over at the beginning and do this again for 10 minutes, that is bad checkpointing. General rule of thumb in game design. Unless you are doing something that's deliberately meant to be, to have a very sense of tension and survival based on skill on it, like for example, Demon Souls. Unless you're playing, unless you're designing Demon Souls, you do serious checkpointing. No, you should not be have to start over f five minutes, more than five minutes from where you start from the last time you died. Checkpoints should basically only set you back about yeah five to three three to five minutes unless you're doing stealth where the checkpointing is more related on related on how far you progress in the level and then at which point the checkpointing will then basically be less time related in those cases. Um, as in that point, it's more, well, if you die, you then, the next time you go through, it'll be a little quicker because you'll have figured out the guard routine more and, okay, I don't have to do this this time. Stealth is a little bit of a different animal when it comes to checkpointing. To be fair to the game, I was playing on the second highest difficulty, double O, not double O classic. And... I don't recall if there are any checkpoint differences in lower difficulties from the gameplay video I've seen at lower difficulties the checkpointing is identical so it's not a difficulty problem in terms of checkpoints being shifted in different places so depending on what difficulties you do well at if you're playing this game on normal and you and you tend to struggle on normal this will still have your, this problem there Anyway, this problem did stop me from playing this game to completion. I thought it stopped me close enough to the end that I know this thing's going to finish. It's not a big deal. So, there's that. Um, multiplayer, I did get to play a bunch of multiplayer. It's okay. It plays like Call of Duty game multiplayer with the one problem that, at the time I played it, Modern Warfare 3 was out. And so, there aren't a lot of people playing the multiplayer right now. If you wait a few minutes, you can get a game in Team Deathmatch, Tender Deathmatch, or occasionally Golden Gun. But that's it. A lot of the other multiplayer modes, like um, Data Download or whatever it is, or there's a Hot Potato mode, 
none of those have a real sense of checkpointing, I guess, is the best way of putting it. Um, and the checkpoint, but a sense of lots of players playing it. There are. Mm, there's nobody playing those modes, actually. They have. I mean, they even have Gun Game. They brought Gun Game over from Call of Duty Black Ops, and nobody's playing it, which is really disappointing because Gun Game is a fun mode. Gun Game is a fun gameplay mode. I wanted to see what it was like in this game. Nobody's playing that. Um, it's just really disappointing. And basically, that that's my kind of my reaction to the game is this game is kind of disappointing. The multi, the single player is almost, almost perfect, aside from the checkpointing problems and the narrative problems. The multiplayer is fun, and I'd say it is rock solid, but nobody's playing it, which means that the fun game modes they put in there to play off of the fact that this is a Bond game aren't there. You thus. You're actually having to wait longer to level up your character enough that you can do class customization and add sights to your weapons and that sort of thing. You can't customize your classes till you hit level 8. You level up kind of quickly if you were playing games regularly, as far as in terms of if, you have, if you're able to play games fairly regularly and quickly, you can level up fast. But there aren't enough people playing to, let, to allow you to get in the game quickly. If you get dropped from a game because of ping or other problems, or because the person running, the person who's the server for the game, quits, then you have to wait a while to find another game. It's 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 disappointing. And further, they're not gonna get you're not getting maps for this game. You're not. They're not gonna put a map pack out for this. Modern Warfare Three is out. They're gonna put, gonna put maps for that. They're paying all their attention to that. Maybe if we're lucky, they'll port a map from this over to Modern Warfare 3, but I doubt it. So, frankly, rent this game first. If you think you're going to play through this game another time, if you're going to get friends together for multiplayer, if you're going to go through one of the co-op levels and play it that way, then buy it. Only in the circumstances where you know that you'll be able to get players consistently to play this game. Not for any other reason. So, with that done, until next time, I'm Count Zero. Thanks for watching.